I'm Emily Young. I'm the Office Administrator for Keep Pearland Beautiful. Thanks for joining our monthly garden lecture tonight. We upload all of our past garden lectures on our website, which is pearlandrecycles.com after each lecture. Please be sure to take the survey once you complete the lecture tonight. I have it in the live description and I'll also pin it in the comments below. Feel free to ask any questions you might have in the comments. I'm gonna pass it over to Joanne Nodal here, who is going to moderate the lecture tonight. Thank you, Emily, and good evening, everyone. This is Joanne Nodal. I'm with the Brazoria County Master Gardeners Association. We share information through our website, um, Brazoria County Master Gardeners. You can search for us, use the Google search engine to search for us and we'll pop up. You can also check out the Brazoria County AgriLife Horticulture web pages on the web for a lot of great information on horticulture and gardening in Brazoria County. Uh, you can ask questions through that website and get information and resources. And you can also follow us on Facebook. Brazoria County Master Gardeners can be found on, on Facebook too. Tonight, we're really lucky to have this presentation on wildflowers, and this is the perfect time of year to be talking about wildflowers. We couldn't have timed it better if anybody's uh, driven a little bit out of town on one of our farm roads. We're already seeing um, wide splashes of blue, blue bonnets and Indian paintbrush. Uh, we're, the show has started. With us tonight is our presenter. We want to welcome Kimberly Mayer. Kimberly is the Brazoria County AgriLife Horticulturalist. She's our horticulturalist agent. We're very lucky to have her. The Master Gardeners appreciate her support as our advisor. And uh, she just returned recently from a class uh, from Texas A&M on turf grass. So I'm sure that she'll be... Uh, sharing what we she learned from that in the future. But tonight, we're going to go wild about wildflowers. And remember, if you have any questions along the way, I'll be monitoring the comments on Facebook, and I can relay the question to Kimberly. Thank you. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Howdy, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope we have some wildflower, wildflower fans listening in. And if you're not a fan yet, I hope that you will be by the end of our presentation tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Kimberly Mayer. I work for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And like Joanne said, I am the horticulture agent for Brazoria County. So maybe some of you are asking what in the world is extension? I've never heard of that. Um, we like to, to say that it's the, the best kept secret around. Um, so Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service is a unique education agency with a statewide network of professional educators, trained volunteers, and county offices. For over 100 years, the agency has improved lives across Texas by delivering innovative science-based solutions and education at the intersection of health, agriculture, and environment in communities across the state. Today, we continue the legacy of service, bringing together traditional outreach and modernized tools to Texans right where they are. So basically what that means is that I am responsible for providing educational research on all things horticulture related, from trees to turf to tomatoes. My goal is to deliver scientific and research-based programming for the residents of Brazoria County. Another part of my job is to oversee and advise the Brazoria County Master Gardeners. They are a phenomenal group of people who took the time to be fully trained as a Master Gardener and give back to the community through volunteering with things like plant and tree sales, speaking engagements, and various educational outreach events for youth and adults. This group of volunteers is quite dedicated and works tirelessly for our area. I'll share some more information on how you can learn more about our master gardeners at the end of the presentation. 
So outside of my eight to five job, I wear a few other hats. I am also the executive director for Keep Richwood Beautiful. Richwood is a small bedroom community located between Lake Jackson and Angleton. And as a Keep Texas Beautiful affiliate, we plan cleanup events and beautification projects for our community. Along with these events, KRB also funds our local community garden, of which I run the day-to-day -day operations. At the moment, we have 11 raised beds for vegetable production, an herb garden, several citrus trees and containers, three compost bins, a monarch way station, and believe it or not, just in the nick of time, we have some blue bonnets sprouting up in one of our uh, back areas. And then um, just personally, my, uh, my husband and I have been married for 24 years. We have four adult children and two beautiful granddaughters. So enough about me, let's talk about wildflowers. Here's a quick outline of what we will be covering today. We're going to talk about the top 10 most common wildflowers and how to plant them, how to care for them. I'll give you a brief history of the Lady Bird Johnson, who is the founder of the National Wildflower Research Center. And I'll share with you uh, TxDOT's wildflower seeding program and the best driving routes for seeing these, uh, these, beauty, these beauties along our, our roadside. So here's the dirt. What exactly is a wildflower? The dictionary defines it as a flower of an uncultivated variety or a flower growing freely without human intervention. By expert estimates, there are over 20,000 species of flowering plants in North America belonging to about 300 different families. Those that grow in the wild or on their own without cultivation are called wildflowers. And then wildflowers indigenous to the continent are called natives. Others, which may be quite common but not indigenous, have been introduced from some other part of the world and they're referred to as naturalized. Both types share one common distinction and that is that they are equipped to grow on their own in nature. So you may know them as wildflowers or natives. They really are one and the same. Now you may be thinking that you're already familiar with the most common wildflowers in our area, but you might be surprised to know that the most common wildflowers often have the most history to them. And that's what I enjoy sharing about, that rich history and folklore of the wildflower. So let's start with this year's wildflower of the year, the blanket flower. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? So beautiful. Blanket flower are vibrant symbols of warmth and friendship. A well-loved Texas icon, fire wheels and other blanket flower rarely exist in isolation. They tend to grow in mass or blanketing the ground with cheerful color and symbolizing the togetherness that we all crave, especially now, right? These eye-catching blooms are also resourceful, sometimes popping up in sidewalk cracks and reminding, that, reminding us that it's possible to overcome even the most challenging circumstances. All of this, plus the fact that bees and butterflies love it, is what inspired Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to declare the blanket flower our 2022 Wildflower of the Year. So firewheel or Indian blanket is a popular annual growing one to two feet tall. The hairy stem is usually much branched and becomes woody at the base late in the season. Branched stems, mostly leafy near the base, have showy flower heads with rays that are red at the base, tipped with yellow, each with three teeth at the broad end. You can kind of see that, hopefully you can see that pretty well in the picture there. Occasionally, the three cleft rays are solid orange or yellow. The disc flowers in the center are a brownish red. So you can see these along roadsides in the Southwest. They stand out like showy, you know, 4th of July pinwheels at the top of their slender stalks. 
Varieties are very popular in cultivation because they tolerate heat and dryness. We're, we're all familiar with that in Texas, right? Among several species in the Southwest, some flowers are entirely yellow. Like these bright red and yellow flowers in the height of spring, the legends surrounding the Indian blanket's origin have grown wild through the ebb and flow of time. Several stories have become widespread in modern culture. One of them from a Mexican origin tells how the flower was once entirely yellow and beloved by the Aztecs. After Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés invaded the Valley of Mexico in 1519, the flowers were said to have been permanently stained red by the blood of the Aztecs. Indian blanket is a major wildflower of the prairies and meadows. It reseeds readily and is easy to grow. Good drainage is the only requirement. Rich soils will produce large floppy plants with few flowers. Indian blanket is commonly used in roadside and meadow plantings. This species is a short-lived perennial in warm coastal areas. The bloom period can be prolonged by deadheading and supplemental summer watering. And it's also recognized by pollination ecologists as attracting large numbers of native bees. The seeds um, are commercially available and I'll, I'll share with you shortly um, some, a place where you can purchase seeds. Um, as far as the maintenance for, for this wildflower, it's one of the easiest ones to establish. Although Indian blanket will grow in a variety of soil types, for best results, you wanna choose an open to lightly shaded site, having loose, well-drained soil. Blanket flower frequently exhibits blanket-like density, which combines with the blending of bright reds and yellows to form a striking tapestry of color. It's a beautiful painting. So you wanna plant these in the fall and rake the seed into loose topsoil to ensure good seed to soil contact. With moisture from rain or watering, blanket flower will germinate in one to two weeks and establish a healthy taproot system before the winter frost, before the first winter frost. So number two on our list of top 10 wildflowers will probably be recognizable to all of you. It's the state flower of Texas, the blue bonnet. Perhaps it, it tends to be among the first colorful flowers to appear each spring. One of the better known legends tells the tale of a Comanche tribe suffering a bitter, bitter winter. The medicine men knew that they would have to sacrifice their most prized possession to appease the great spirit. Overhearing their conversation, a young girl decided she must sacrifice hers, a little doll adorned with blue jay feathers. After everyone went to sleep, she burned the doll and scattered its ashes in the wind, and the tribe awoke the next morning to see the hillsides blanketed in blue. Quite a, quite a tale. There's another legend. Um, this is, was told to um, a fellow horticulturalist, Greg Grant. He's a um, county extension agent and plant developer for Texas A&M in Tyler. And he was told a Mexican legend by an elderly Hispanic woman about um, a pink blue bonnet. And I'm curious to know maybe if, if there's several of you online, if you've seen a pink blue bonnet, I'd love to, to hear about it in the comments. And so while you're typing that, let me share with you a little bit um, about the legend of the pink blue bonnet. It goes like this. One April, many years ago, two children were playing in a field of wildflowers with their grandmother near San Antonio. Upon finding a white flower among the blue, the grandmother explained to her excited grandchildren that they were playing in a field of blue bonnets. And on rare occasions, a white one is among them. Some even say the lone star uh, of the Texas state flag was fashioned after a spot of white blue bonnets among a field of blue. And what about this pink one, one child asked, pointing to a flower at his feet. The grandmother paused and remembered that when she was a little girl, her grandmother told her a special story about these rare flowers. They only seem to grow downstream from the Mission Alamo. And that is because of something that happened there many years ago. 
She went on to tell of how their ancestors once owned a beautiful house and farm before Santa Ana's army took over the Texans, took over the Texans in the bloody battle of the Alamo. Heartbroken, but thankful that their lives had been spared, the grandmother, then a child, witnessed her mother place a pink wildflower in a vase beside the statue of the Virgin Mary. She told me she had found it near the river where it had, had once been white, but so much blood had been shed, it had taken the tint of it. After relaying her grandmother's story to her own grandchildren, she stopped to explain the meaning she had given the rare flower. That is why you will only find the pink ones near the river within sight of the old mission, she said. So remember, the next time you see a pink blue bonnet, it's not only a pretty flower, but a symbol for the struggle to survive and of those who died so that Texas could be free. So whether this legend is true or not, Greg Grant, uh, that horticulturalist that I told you about, agrees that the only place that they have found those rare pink blue bonnets is um, in the wild along the road just south of San Antonio. So hopefully we have some um, Texas history buffs out there tonight that are listening. Maybe this is something you've heard or maybe this is some, something new for you, but I thought it was a, a, a great story to tell. So on that note, um, everyone knows that blue bonnets come in colors besides blue. But I have to tell you, horticulturalists have been shocked recently to receive reports of a multicolored variety found growing in the hill country. Experts from Aggie Horticulture verified the wildflower is indeed a variety that has never been seen before and named it the rainbow blue bonnet. Amazingly, its petals transition their colors the way the gradient does um, in a rainbow. Experts are unsure if this mutation occurred naturally or was created by someone, but nevertheless, we now have a new color of wildflower to look for. And so I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> how many of you out there are taking me seriously because gotcha, this is just an April Fool's joke. Um, there is no newly discovered rainbow blue bonnets. Um, thought I would give, make sure everybody was awake out there. Hope you are. So gotcha, it's an April Fool's joke. So while there is no rainbow version, the blue bonnets do come in different varieties. Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Hort horticulturalists work with seed producers, growers, and farmers to domesticate the blue bonnet. In 1982, Texas naturalist Carol Abbott, or he's often called Mr. Texas Blue Bonnet, came up with the idea to create the Texas flag out of blue bonnets for the 1986 Texas sesquicentennial. His proposal has grown to involve thousands of people, created a multi-million dollar agriculture industry and generated unthinkable publicity for Texas A&M. Some pretty incredible blue bonnet breakthroughs because of these efforts include transplants, rapidly germinating, chemically scarified seed, and early blooming plant types. These were needed to create the state flag with different colored blue bonnets. So a blue bonnet is called a blue bonnet, no matter the color. If a blue bonnet is white, it's simply a white blue bonnet, not a white bonnet. Not so a blue bonnets have always existed in nature. To proliferate different colored blue bonnets, botanists across the state set out to find seeds from white and pink blue bonnets. By collecting seeds from only these colors, natural selection was sped up. So here are some of the different colors of blue bonnets. So we've talked about blue, of course. There's a white. Finding a white blue bonnet feels like finding a four-leaf clover. These really stick out amongst the blue blue bonnets. So consequently, many knew where, where those populations of white blue bonnets existed. There's the pink. Um, Abbott, that um, naturalist, had roamed the blue bonnet fields of Texas his entire life and only found three pink blue bonnet plants. A large population of them was discovered within the city limits of San Antonio. It's kind of 
um, kind of works with our legend there, our story, then Abbott's dream was able to become reality once the pink blue bonnet was purified, it allowed the development of the red and the maroon blue bonnets. So our maroon blue bonnets are in, in honor of Greg Grant, who is the first to recognize the Lupinus Havarti as a cut flower. The Bear County Master Gardener work crew is instrumental in stocking seeds, which will eventually enable acreage of the red and maroon blue bonnets to be grown. The red and maroon colors would probably vanish without their efforts. So kudos to the Bear County Master Gardeners. That's a lot of hard work. And then Henry's Red is in order, is in honor of the late uh, Mr. Henry Verstratton, a San Antonio vegetable grower who grew and ensured the seed increase of each blue bonnet color, uh, each variant in his small retirement garden. And then finally, in that lower corner there is lavender. The one shown here is the Barbara Bush Lavender Blue Bonnet. That's a selection of Texas blue bonnets known for its unusual flower color in several shades of lavender. The, that selection was made originally by Dr. Jerry Parsons. So due to the efforts of many people, one day Texans may think of a lot of different colored flowers when they hear the word blue bonnets. So in order to propagate these, they can be um, uh, propagated by sowing seed or planting seedlings in the fall. You'll allow the blue bonnet to reseed itself by leaving the seed pods intact on the plant until they um, turn from yellow to brown. Uh, scarification will, has will hasten uh, germination, you can put the seeds in the freezer overnight and then douse with boiling water to crack the seed coats. Soaking them overnight is also effective. You would, after you soak them, you would drain the water, add rhizobium and plant. Plants that are doing poorly sometimes respond to additional rhizobium applications. So if you're kind of, if you've never heard of rhizobium, here's um, a, somewhat of an explanation. This rhizobium is an inoculant that's applied directly to the seed before planting. There's a symbiotic relationship of rhizobium bacteria cultures that colonizes the crop roots to help gather and fix free nitrogen in the air, making it more available to the plants. The treatment, this treatment of this inoculant enables faster germination and stimulates plant hormones responsible for root formation and development. And that results in healthy plant growth and higher yields. And um, just FYI, um, you, you're able to go online um, and purchase that rhizobium inocul inoculant if that's something that you're interested in. And so I know what's going through most of your minds right now. I have got to have these beauties right now. Where is the best place to buy blue bonnet seeds? So a Native American seed is the best place to order them. They are recommended by the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Research Center. Um, and um, I believe I've given the link to Joanne. So whenever she gets a chance, um, maybe she would add that link into the comments. It's um, www.seedsource.com. And that will take you to their website where you can browse through um, their, their selection of seeds, of wildflower seeds. All right, number three on our list is the Texas Indian paintbrush. So if blue bonnets are the star of the spring wildflower show, the Indian paintbrush is their co-star. Well, perhaps more of a sidekick because it's a parasitic plant, meaning that it relies on other plants to grow. One of the many reasons it's often found embedded in a field of blue bonnets. About 200 different species of the flower exist, and nine of them are native to Texas. While Indian paintbrush is by far the flower's most common name, it's also occasionally nicknamed butterfly weed, prairie fire, painted lady, and grandmother's hair. The latter name is attributed to the Chippewa tribe who used the flowers to make a hair wash 
and treat women's illnesses in addition to rheumatism. The flower's common name comes from Native American folklore. A young painter obsessed with capturing the colors and beauty of the sunset grew frustrated that he only had crude paints made from pounded minerals and stiff br brushes too rigid to copy the sky. So he asked the great spirit for guidance. One night, an old man and a beautiful young woman came to him in a dream carrying a pure white deer skin. They whispered to him to use it as a canvas. And that, and that as evening came, he should head to the hillside where he would find everything he needed to paint. The next day, he gathered all of his supplies and found paint brushes of every hue, bright reds, oranges, and yellows. As the sun began to set, he colored his deerskin canvas feverishly, discarding the brushes and the grass as he worked. The painting was a masterpiece, far more beautiful than any, anything he had ever painted. And the next morning, as he walked about the camp, he looked to the hill, and there, where he tossed aside his brushes, were bright flowers in every color of the sunset. I thought that was a pretty cool story, nice little legend. So one of the popular paintbrushes, this showy annual, grows six to 18 inches high. Its several unbranched stems form clumps topped by bright red paintbrush-like spikes. The flowers are less conspicuous than the bracts and greenish at the base. They are uh, showy, typically red-tipped, and sometimes they produce a light yellow or pure white variation mixed in with the red. Together, the flowers form three to eight inch spikes. This and other uh, castaleja species are hemiparasitic, especially on grasses, penetrating these host roots to obtain a portion of their nutrients. Transplanting paintbrush may kill it. Indian paintbrush has a reputation for being unpredictable. In some years, when blue bonnets, which, as you know, flower at a, about the same time as Indian paintbrush, when they are especially colorful, paintbrush, uh, Indian paintbrush will have just an average flowering, flowering year, and other years, the paintbrush is spectacular. So they, they kind of take turns. It, for propagation, you can seed this in open, sunny sites for best results. Indian paintbrush seed may require a cold, wet period in the winter to germinate. You want to plant the seeds in the fall and rake it into a loose topsoil. Uh, and again, you want to make sure and get that good seed to soil contact. These seeds are exceptionally small. Um, if you were to buy a pound of these, there would be 4 million seeds per pound. Um, they are commercially available. And depending on the previous year's seed crop, they can be expensive. The recommended uh, seeding rate is about a quarter pound per acre. Number four, the pink evening primrose. You may know it from childhood uh, and, and called it a buttercup. Maybe you even stuck your nose in there to get the yellow pollen on your nose. I remember doing that as a little girl. But pink ladies or pink evening primrose is an upright um, one to two foot perennial which spreads to form extensive colonies. You may have seen it in your turf grass lately. <laughs> it comes up there as well. It's large four petaled flowers range in color from dark pink to white. The buds open into pink or white flowers. They're in the upper leaf um, on slender uh, downy stems. The delicate textured cup-shaped blossoms are lined with pink or red veins. The foliage is usually, usually linear and pinnate, although leaves can be entire, um, can be, you know, lance-shaped depending on the locality. Uh, this is a hardy and drought-resistant species that can form colonies of considerable size. The flowers, um, during drought conditions can be small and, and possibly only about an inch wide. And the plant um, is frequently grown in garden, gardens. As the common name implies, most evening primrose species open their flowers in the evening, closing them again early each morning. 
The flowers of some members of the genus open in the evening so rapidly that the movement can almost be observed. Pink if evening primrose populations in the southern part of its natural range, however, open their flowers in the morning and close them each evening. And then to just, you know, to make it harder to further complicate matters, populations in the northern parts of its range tend to open in the evening. You can propagate these um, by seed in the fall. And um, like I've mentioned on some of the, on almost all of the other wildflowers, you, you can rake that into loosened topsoil to ensure good seed to soil contact. And um, it, it, when I was doing my research on this, it did say that this, the seeds may be um, a little difficult to germinate um, and really, um, the, the pre-germination requirements are, have not been determined, so they can be a little tricky to, to, to germinate for you. Number five on our list is horse mint. Horse mint has a distinctive citrus or lemony scent when the leaves are rubbed or crushed. It is very easy to grow and often forms large colonies. Bees and butterflies are definitely attracted to this plant. This purple plant that grows here in Texas was used as an insect repellent, which is how it got called horse mint. So the story goes that one time a man um, was there whose dad used it often. His dad had horses and would bundle up the horse mint, tie it to rafters in the barn, and then shoe horses where the plant would rub on their backs, on the backs of the horses. It worked as an insect repellent to keep the flies off the horses, and that way they wouldn't become too agitated for the farrier. Horse mint actually contains a citronella, a natural insect repellent. So it turns out the folk practice in this case is actually very functional. Bug sprays and other commercial products use the same type of ingredients. So horse mint is known by a number of common names. You may know it as lemon balm. It's a one to two foot aromatic winter annual with unusual tuft-like lavender to pink whorled flower heads. Each whorl is the elongated spike. Each whorl in the elongated spike is um, subtended by whitish or lavender-like bracts. Several stems grow from the base and are lined with pairs of lance-shaped leaves. For propagation, um, the horse mint is easily grown from seed. Uh, you'll use the same type of directions that we've talked about um, earlier, um, rake it into the topsoil in the fall. Uh, it will need a little bit of supplemental watering if we don't have a lot of rain in the spring, uh, and it may need some additional water in May um, if, if the plants um, haven't reached their full potential, haven't got to you know, a good 10 to 12 inches. But once established, it should um, reseed itself. And um, these seeds are commercially available as well. So we're just gonna keep trucking along. Number six here on our uh, list is Mexican hat. So just about the time that blue bonnets and Indian paintbrush make their exit, the Mexican hat flower makes its debut. Colonies of these wildflowers grace Texas fields and roadsides from East Texas through um, the Pecos River and to the Panhandle from May through July. Here are a few interesting facts about Mexican hat flowers. The Mexican hat is a flower with the perfect name. This hardy flower resembles a Mexican sombrero. That's a broad brimmed hat typically worn in Mexico and in the Southwest. The flower is also known as the long-headed cone flower and thimble flower. Both very descriptive names of this colorful flower that grows as tall as three plus feet. But make no mistake about it, the Mexican hat is not some Sissy, high maintenance flower. Mexican hat graces our Texas highways and byways from May through July and can take that brutal, tough Texas heat. This drought resistant flower makes it perfect for inexperienced gardeners or those who prefer low maintenance gardening. The nectar rich Mexican hat 
attracts beneficial insects, bees, and butterflies. The flower is deer resistant, but it is on the menu for big game animals. Birds and small mammals prefer the seed of the flower. Domestic livestock enjoy this nutritious flower when it's in its early stages of growth. Native Americans discovered that the Mexican hat flower has some medicinal qualities. Indians boiled the leaves to make a type of tea that they applied externally to treat snake bites and to reduce the symptoms of poison ivy. And reportedly, they've also made a medicinal tea from the ripened flower heads and leaves to treat non-specified medical issues. However, since we're lacking some, some specific information on this, I don't recommend trying this at home. Just stick with drink, drinking good old Lipton tea instead. So this plant is branched and leafy in the lower part with long leafless stalks bearing flower heads of three to seven yellow or yellow and red brown drooping rays surrounding a long red brown central disc with sombrero shaped flower heads. It's usually one and a half feet tall, but can reach three feet. Flower petals range from dark red and yellow to all red or all yellow. The flower's central brown disc protrudes a half an inch to two inches above the drooping petals. Leaves on the lower portion of the stem are feathery and deeply cleft. The colorful flower heads resembling the traditional broad brimmed high centered hat worn during Mexican fiestas often bloom by the thousands. Now this is also very um, easy to propagate from seed in the spring or the fall, though fall seeding is recommended. The seeds don't have to be uh, treated, but they may benefit from a period of stratification. Plants usually seed, plants from seed usually bloom on the second year. They may also need some supplemental uh, watering in the, if the winter and the spring are unusually dry and watering in the summer often extends the flowering period. After the flowering um, ceases, you can allow the seed to completely mature um, before you mow down and reseed or collect seed to plant in another area. Number seven, we're getting through this. <laughs> Number seven is the Black-Eyed Susan. So if you're like me, maybe you've wondered how flowers get their names. Maybe you enjoy hearing about this folklore and the legends of these wildflowers. Well, here's another interesting story of the Black-Eyed Susan and Sweet William. And this is as told in an old English poem by John Gay. And it goes like this. All in the downs, the fleet was moored, banners waving in the wind, when black-eyed Susan came aboard and eyed the burly men. Tell me, ye sailors, tell me true, if my sweet William sails with you. So Susan was searching for her lover, William, prior his, to his departure on a long sea voyage. She'd been crying and had black circles around her eyes because her mascara was running. Um, sweet William, Susan's pet name for William, consoled her as the two of them said their final farewells. And legend has it that Black-Eyed Susan and Sweet William, which you see right next to her on the slide there, um, bloom at the same time to celebrate their eternal love for each other. And they do look lovely together with her golden yellow and his bright reds and purple. So maybe there's some, some hopeless romantics out there along with me that enjoyed that story. So Rudbeckia herta is a North American native wildflower and grows through the United States and Canada. The name Black-Eyed Susan, like we just learned, was probably given to the plant by early British colonists when they arrived in the New World. Depending on growing conditions, this species may act as an annual, biennial, or short-lived perennial. Bright yellow, two to three inches wide, daisy-like flowers with dark centers are its claim to fame. They occur singly atop one to two foot stems. The stems and, are, and scattered oval leaves um, and they're covered with bristly hairs. 
a coarse, rough stemmed with a daisy like flower that's made up of showy golden yellow ray flowers with a disc disc of flowers forming a brown central cone. Steam stems, leaves, and fillories are covered with hairs that give it a slightly rough texture. This um, also propagates very easily from a seed. Uh, you can sow that in the fall or the spring. They are drought tolerant, but they do respond well to an occasional watering and additional irrigation on, in a dry year will improve the density and lengthen the flowering season. Number eight, prairie verbena. What is verbena? It's also known as vervain. Maybe that's how you recognize it. But this plant is often confused with lemon verbena. Lemon verbena is actually an entirely different plant. Both vervain and lemon verbena are in the same plant family but there are many plants in the verbena family, but not all are used medicinally as the same way as vervain. The use of vervain for medicinal, ceremonial, and superstitious purposes goes back thousands of years. Ancient cultures throughout Europe have held vervain in high esteem. The significance of vervain as a cultural symbol and healing plant is partly how it acquired its many names. Even its nicknames convey adoration, as in it's called the herb of love and the herb of the cross. Vervain was a sacred plant to several ancient civilizations, including ancient Egypt. Egyptians believed vervain first sprung from the tears of the goddess Isis as she mourned the death of the god Osiris. In ancient Persia, the Persians also treated vervain as a sacred plant. Gently rounded clusters of bilaterally symmet symmetrical pink, lavender, or purple flowers bloom atop stems with highly divided leaves. The Spanish name moradilla comes from morado or purple and means a little purple one. This plant often forms brilliant displays of pink or light purple covering acres of ground. It is a variable complex with some plants tall and pink flowered others more matted and with lavender or purple flowers. The two forms are usually found in separate areas. So um, this attracts birds. It is highly um, deer resistant um, and usually blooms from March through October. All right, number nine, Plains Coreopsis. This little North American native is more than just a pretty face. Coreopsis tinctora is an airy little wildflower that graces the sunny meadows and roadsides every summer. Originally native to the eastern half of the continent, it has naturalized from coast to coast and all across Canada and Alaska. It is equally at home in cottage gardens and along roadsides, known by a couple, by a, a number of descriptive common names like tick seed, calliopsis, Plains Coreopsis, Dyer's Coreopsis, and Golden Wave. It's not only pretty, but useful as well. The Latin word tinctura means useful for dye. Native Americans boiled the flowers to make a type of beverage. The roots, roots were steeped into a tea that eased the symptoms of abdominal discomforts. Folklore indicates that the, the tea was also supposed to protect the drinker from being hit by lightning. Not sure exactly how that works, but that's what I read and researched. Early settlers also believed that stuffing their mattresses with the dried plants uh, would repel bed bugs. And then the Zuni women believed that if they wanted a daughter, the tea would help conceive one as well. However, all of these uses were secondary to its main purpose. Um, this a sunny little flower produces a lovely yellow or red dye. So this is a slender one to two foot, sometimes taller annual with pinnately compound foliage. Tick seed is known for its small but abundant yellow flowers. They're painted maroon near the center. It's got numerous smooth, slightly angled branches bearing showy daisy-like flower heads with yellow rays surrounding a reddish purple central disc. 
The yellow petals are notch tipped. Flower heads occur on long stalks from the multi branching stems. This prevailingly Western annual has escaped from cultivation in the East. It is widespread in the West and the South in disturbed areas such as moist ditches. Because of its showiness, the flower is cultivated extensively, hence its common name. And number 10, Texas thistle. The thistle is an interesting specimen to research because although many varieties produce a pretty purple or blue head, the plant's prickly stem and branches win most of the attention. Like its rough exterior, the meaning of the flower is associated with aggressiveness, pain, protection, and pride. Since thistle is defined as both a flower and a weed, the exact inference of the bloom can extend from less positive symbolism such as poverty and weakness, all the way to qualities of might and brilliance. Throughout history, many cultures have adopted the flower as a positive emblem, cultivating unique stories that tell the tales of past heritages. France, for instance, associates a thistle as a weapon against witches and bad doers. Commonly called flower of the sun or herb of witches, the French believed that witches could not look into the sun, but the strong thistle always stood proudly to face the light. Because of this, Lore proclaims that the flower is the icon for the sun sent down to protect others from harm and evil. The Texas thistle grows two to six feet tall without branches or sparingly branched near the top. The numerous leaves are alternate, four to nine inches long, smaller on the upper third of the stem. Leaves are green above and white below with a woolly texture on the other underside. The irregular lobes have spines at the tip, but few elsewhere on the leaf. There is one flower head to a stem with no ray flowers, but numerous, usually purplish disc flowers. So now that I have um, excited you with all these beautiful flowers, whoops, excuse me, um, and enticed you with all these beautiful colors, I bet your next question is, how do I plant and care for my wildflowers? So let me start with some pitfalls that you want to avoid. It is not uncommon for landscapes to be overwatered, over fertilized, or over applied with pesticides. These practices can be harmful to your landscape, um, also harmful to our water resources, and the beneficial wildlife that call our community home. Once established, your wildflowers are well adapted to the climate and soils of our region and will probably need less care than you think. So let's start at the beginning. You want to select the proper location. The orientation of your home and landscape in relation to the sun is particularly important. In most cases, the west side of the home will receive the brunt of that hot, blistering afternoon sun during the hottest part of the day, while the east side of the home will likely receive less intense morning sunlight. The southern orientation usually receives more sunlight for the greater part of the year, with the north facing landscape often receiving more shade as the sun might be blocked by buildings, fences, trees. So you want to avoid planting your natives, um, these wildflowers or your pollinator gardens in spots that receive less than six hours of sunlight per day. You also wanna have access to water. In addition to finding the right sunlight conditions on your property, having access to water is just as critical especially during the establishment phase of your plants. When choosing your location and before you plant, make sure your proposed garden location has some sort of water supply nearby. This could be a faucet connected hose, a soaker hose, or better yet, drip irrigation installed for increased water efficiency. You also want to prep your soil before you plant, it's a good idea to add compost and amend your soil. Healthy soil is one of the most important factors in achieving success as a gardener in Texas. 
The plant material above ground is a direct result, a direct reflection of what lies beneath. Soil not only provides anchoring for plants, but it also plays a role in moisture and nutrient availability as well. By nurturing your, soul, your soil, you in turn nurture the plants above. Compost is a, rich, is a nutrient rich soil conditioner consisting of broken down organic matter. It's not a fertilizer per se, but it works like fertilizer insurance. It's also a cure-all for many soil issues. For new beds, incorporate up to one to two inches of compost into the top three to six inches of your soil with a spade, a shovel, or some other tool um, to improve your drainage and increase your soil's nutrient uh, availability. If you have sandier soil, compost can also serve to improve your soil's ability to hold water and prevent excess nutrient leaching. For existing landscape beds, consider top dressing with a quarter inch of compost before applying mulch. So you'll also want to plant properly. For best results, plant within one to four days after receiving your plants. Planting in the early morning or when temperatures cool in the evening is not only easier on the plants, but it's easier on the planter. Leaving the plants in their container, you'll want to first lay out each plant in their correlating spot in your design. And then this allows you some flexibility to make some minor adjustments as needed before they're actually placed in the ground. Remember that although these plants are small now, most of these will grow to be two to up to five feet wide at maturity. So make sure to, to stick to your, your planting design as much as possible and give your plants plenty of room to grow. For best results, dig your holes only as deep as they are planted in the containers. Avoid planting too deep or too shallow. The holes should be dug two to three times wider than the diameter of the plant. So you'll simply um, squeeze the Squeeze the bottom of the container uh, and pull out that plant. And um, once it's placed in the hole, you'll want to backfill with, um, with that native soil that you previously removed from the, from the hole. And then just gently push down to ensure good root to soil compact contact. But you want to avoid uh, pressing down too hard and com compacting the soil. And then, of course, you'll want to water each plant in thoroughly. Um, to a depth of about six to eight inches or about one inch of water. Now let's talk about mulch. In addition to suppressing weeds, mulch can also buffer soil temperature and help retain moisture. Uh, I recommend spreading two to four inches of mulch around your finished planting area and then play, pay extra close attention to avoid excess mulch around the base of the plants so you want to kind of taper off with a thinner layer where the plant meets the soil. And so let's talk about watering. Now that your plants are in the ground and mulched, the final step is to make sure that they have the right amount of water. Ample moisture will ensure that their immature root system have what they need to get established over the next couple of months. It's also important to water efficiently without over irrigating and causing waste. Um, plus, you know, too much water can lead to increased chances of disease and pest issues. Even highly adapted and water efficient uh, flowers and shrubs need special care during the first few months after planting. But once your garden is established, it will provide long lasting benefits to people and pollinators with little maintenance for years to come. Soak the root zone surrounding each new plant. Hand watering works well too, uh, but any method that evenly distributes water until the soil around your plants is wet is okay too. And then you'll wanna check back every three to four days by using um, your finger to make sure that there's adequate moisture in there. If you have a soil moisture probe, even better, use that to check. And while it's important to pay special attention to watering your young plants for the first few seasons, 
one of the main benefits of the plants um, of these wildflowers and natives that, that you'll be choosing um, is that after establishment, they are well adapted to the unique climate of Texas, including um, some of our sporadic rainfall patterns and that darn excessive Texas heat. They will still need some water from time to time. So a great tip is to water deeply and infrequently. Once established, these native and adaptive plants do a great job of tapping into the moisture lower in the soil. Watering too much or too often can cause more harm than good, especially for those with poor draining, heavy clay soils like us here in Brazoria County. In general, a good rule of thumb is to irrigate with no more than a half an inch of water per week for established natives and uh, perennial flowers and, and shrubs that are in your garden. Of course, when it rains, you won't need to water at all. Um, and then you also might consider um, a soil test at some point to assess the nutrient availability in your garden. Um, usually I like to recommend taking a soil um, sample every two to three years so that, um, and you can send that into um, the lab at Texas A&M um, University and they can um, offer you fertilizer recommendation based on nutrient deficiencies that might be at your specific site. All right, and then just really quickly, I just, I added these next two slides in just to offer you some other selections that you might consider um, planting. These are recommendations from the Coastal Prairie Conservancy. Their mission is to sustain a resilient Texas by preserving coastal prairies, wetlands, farms, and ranches to benefit people and wildlife forever. So the Conservancy has a nine natives program, which helps to promote the value of native plants to pollinators and how these native plants are important to the prairie landscape. By bringing bits of the prairie into the city, individuals and families can help support pollinators and learn about the historic coastal prairie landscape. The Coastal Prairie Conservancy, Conservancy has produced a video and supporting materials that demonstrate how to create a poll pollinator garden and how this will make a difference for wildlife throughout the city. And so if you want some more detailed information, the Coastal Pra Prairie Conservancy, Conservancy whew, that's, a, that's a mouthful, um, has a really great website. I believe um, we can put that website um, in the comments if you'd like to check that out. Um, but be sure to, to take a look and look at the nine natives for the sun. And then they've got a list of nine natives for the shade. So maybe your, um, your home or wherever you, you'll be planting your garden has um, lots of shade. There are still um, wildflowers and natives that you, can, um, that you can plant. So be sure to take a look at those. All right, so let me just grab a drink of water real quick. Um, and then we are going to switch gears real quick. And I want to give you a brief history about why and how we are blessed with such wildflower beauty along our Texas highways and byways during the spring and summer months. So this is Lady Bird Johnson. She had a vision to make the world better or beautiful one plant at a time. She recognized that wildflowers and other native plants can lift the spirit and that conserving them and using them in our everyday landscapes is critical to our future. She established the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to realize this dream. Lady Bird Johnson, first lady of the United States and wife of President Lyndon Johnson, worked tirelessly for the preservation of wild landscapes and the environment. More than 200 laws related to the environment were passed during the Johnson administration, many of which were influenced by Mrs. Johnson's work. Among the major legislative initiatives were the Wilder Wilderness Act of 1964, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Program, and the 1965 Highway Beautification Act and many additions to the national park system. For 50 of those major initiatives related to conservation and beautification, 
President Johnson thanked his wife on July 26, 1968, for her dedication by presenting her with 50 pens used to sign these laws. She also received a plaque that read to Lady Bird, who has inspired me and millions of Americans to try to preserve our land and beautify our nation. With love from Lyndon. And then an also um, maybe a little known fact was that at Lady Bird Johnson's urging, Enchanted Rock was purchased by the Nature Conservancy to be set aside for posterity. The owners of the property were thinking of selling it and a rock quarry developer was interested in the rock for its abundant granite. But in 1984, it became an official state natural area, thanks to Lady Bird Johnson. On her birthday, on her 70th birthday in 1982, Lady Bird Johnson and actress Helen Hayes founded the National Wildflower Research Center to protect and preserve North America's native plants and natural landscapes. Johnson donated funding and 60 acres of land in East Austin to establish the organization. It later moved to South Austin and was renamed the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in her honor. When Mrs. Johnson passed away a decade later, the center had just become the part of the, part of the University of Texas at Austin, guaranteeing its permanent place in the national landscape. The center's staff continue to be inspired by Mrs. Johnson's visionary approaches as they work to conserve, restore, and create healthy landscapes in Texas and beyond. So there, if you haven't been, uh, there's a picture of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And um, some of the information on their website talks about how she was bold, she was compassionate, and she was a visionary and adventurer. She was generous. She believed in the power of healthy landscapes to transform lives. Between Lady Bird Johnson and the work that she did to conserve and create healthy landscapes and the work of the Texas Department of Transportation, Texas has a feast for the eyes and for the senses. So there's one more, one more slide there of Lady Bird Johnson in that gorgeous field of wildflowers and I really enjoy this quote um, from Lady Bird Johnson. In fact, on one of my email signatures, I the, the, the email signature says, where flowers bloom, so does hope. So I um, had to stick that favorite quote in there. So um, wildflowers um, along Texas roadsides have enchanted travelers for generations. These colorful gifts of nature return year after year, lulling our senses as we travel to destinations throughout the Lone Star State. Every year, TxDOT does its part to ensure the continuation of this delightful tradition. In spring and summer, they let native plants and grasses grow tall, providing a natural habitat for pollinators and wildlife. This growth also helps conserve water and control erosion. Texas has more than 5,000 species of wildflowers and native grasses. With several ecoregions across the state, you can find a wildflower blooming somewhere in Texas throughout the year. TxDOT oversees 1.2 million acres of right-of-way. They mow just twice each year once in the summer to scatter mature seeds, and again in fall to provide optimum sun and soil conditions for seeds to sprout. TxDOT sows up to 30,000 pounds of seed each year to supplement natural wildflower regeneration, ensuring a continual robust display of blooms in the spring. Just like that there. So a, a quick little history. In 1932, TxDOT hired uh, Jack Gubbles, its first landscape architect, to maintain, preserve, and encourage wildflowers and other native plants along right-of-ways. Working with garden clubs and Boy Scouts and with landowners' permission, the department ga began gathering wildflower seeds and transplanting trees. 
Gubbel's research showed that landscape design could make highways safer by eliminating monotony and using trees to highlight approaching intersections. By 1934, department rules delayed all mowing unless essential for safety until spring and early summer wildflower seasons were over. This practice has stayed in place for more than 85 years and has expanded in today's, into today's full-scale vegetation management system. So you may have seen um, a TxDOT herbicide truck on our roads and thought, what in the world are they doing? Well, they're eradicating weeds. These invasive plants often grow faster and bigger, blocking sunlight and stealing water and nutrients from our wildflowers. So they have vegetation experts that are trained annually in plant identification and herbicide application and regulation. And their weed control is, um, is spot and plant specific, which means they eliminate only unwanted weeds to give the natural, the native grasses and wildflowers space to grow. So TxDOT dis, um, distinguishes a weed as um, an invasive or troublesome plant, and Texas has lots of them, I'm sure you're aware. They can be non-native like Johnson grass, um, and that Johnson grass easily outcompetes other plants is one, and is one of the most controlled weeds in the TxDOT program. Uh, weeds can also be native, like the common sunflower that can grow several feet high. Now, although these are good for pollinators, but left to bloom in certain areas, the sunflower's height can block visibility. So they are forced to control it in areas where it can create unsafe driving conditions. So we've talked about the top 10 wildflowers in Texas and how to grow them. We mentioned some great organizations who are making sure that we continue to see these beautiful blooms in the state of Texas, but where can you drive to see them? Well, I've got you covered. Um, this um, is a map of some of the uh, lo local driving routes. So if you're in uh, beautiful Brazoria County, there's a 70 mile loop that leads to one state park and two national wildlife refuges. Brazos Bend State Park has an incredible variety of wildflowers, including Texas spider lily, floating bladderwort, basket flower, black-eyed Susan, blue bonnets, and more. At Brazoria National Wildlife Refuge, you can look for tropical sage, coreopsis, yellow thistle, spider lily, as well as sedges, rushes, and cattails. And then at the San Bernard National Wildlife Refuge, you want to keep an eye out for sea oxide daisy, along with irises and water lilies and the state champion live oak. And then for more wildflowers, continuing, continue driving south to Quintana Beach County Park and check out the dunes. Um, I won't, I, I know I'm probably getting, oh, yep, way over on time here. So I'll let you, um, we'll go to the next slide and I'll show you where you can find all that information, more, more detailed information. And I'm sure that um, we can put that, um, this link here um, in the comments section for you to read more about that. So let me run through here real quick. If you ever have questions about wildflowers or any horticultural questions, please feel free to email or call at the address and numbers listed on the slide. My contact information is there along with our website and social media handles. Follow us on Facebook to stay abreast of all the things horticulture related. Thank you again. And